All right, kids, today I'm going to read you chapter 16 and 17 of Escape from Warsaw. But before I get to those two chapters, I want to review chapter 14 and chapter 15 with you. The setting of chapter 14, City of the Lost, and chapter 15, Jan Finds a New Pal, are both, they both have the same setting. They both take place in Berlin, Germany. Um, it's probably around 1945. One of the chapters specifically says that it's May. Um, we know that it is at the end of the war because Germany has been defeated and the Allied armies are occupying Germany. So we've got the Russian army there, the British army there, and eventually we're going to find out that the American army is there as well. The characters in these two chapters are Ruth, Branya, Jan, and Edik. Also in um, both of these chapters, uh, we have Captain Greenwood. In chapter 14, he's not named. In chapter 15, he is. Um, and of course, we hear about Bistro the Chimpanzee in chapter 14, and we meet Bistro in chapter 15. Yes, Bistro is not a human, but I did list him because it gives us an insight into Jan. Uh, remember when we first meet Jan that he has the little gray kitten with him, and then the next time we meet Jan, he no longer has the kitten, but he has Jimpy the rooster. Of course, we know what happens to Jimpy. But we're beginning to, oh, oh, and I forgot to mention the lizard that Jan gifted to Ivan when he apologized for being ugly to him. Um, remember, he had to apologize to get the boots before they left Warsaw. So we got an insight into Jan. Jan has a thing for animals. And so at the end of chapter 14, remember, Jan disappears after hearing about Bistro uh, having escaped from the zoo, and Jan has even said uh, the people are going to scare him. Um, the people aren't going to react well to Bistro. And so that's just uh, an insight into Jan when he shows up in chapter 15 that he's there. He loves animals, and he's got a way with them. Okay, so um, just as we're beginning to learn different things about uh, the different characters, of course, Captain Greenwood, when he writes the letter home to his wife, he begins to talk about Ruth and how Ruth is very responsible and how she has adopted Jan and how she takes care of him and, and all of that. So just keep those two things in mind about these two characters. <laughs> All right, so uh, a conflict that I listed in chapter 14, I said it's character versus society slash character versus nature, because honestly, I didn't, I think it would fit in both categories. Um, the fact that Bistro the chimp has escaped from the zoo and people are afraid of that chimpanzee. I said it's character versus society because he's escaped from the zoo. Uh, he doesn't have a choice. He's not a wild chimpanzee living in the jungles. He's been being kept in this zoo in Berlin. So that's kind of the character versus society. But people are afraid of him because he's an animal. He's a wild animal. And that's the character. That's the the nature portion, the character versus nature Um it's character versus society and the fact that officials are trying to recapture this chimpanzee. Um, chimpanzees are very strong. Um, they are wild animals. They can hurt people. So that's why they were trying to recapture him. Okay, uh, chapter 15, I said again, character versus society slash character versus nature. Jan finds Bistro and recaptures him. By being kind and friendly towards Bistro, he treated him well. Um, so Jan is, he's overcoming his concern that he voiced in chapter 14. And he's coming basically to Bistro's 
rescue in chapter 15. Okay, um, because he's more concerned of society hurting Bistro than he is of Bistro hurting society. Also in chapter 15, uh, there's definitely a character versus nature with Captain Greenwood because Captain Greenwood is one of those people that's afraid of Bistro. Okay, just as I would be more like Captain Greenwood and less like Jan if I were to encounter a chimp that had gotten away from the zoo. All right, so a text connection for this chapter, <clears throat> uh, chapter 14 um, and chapter 15, both uh, is a text, to ne text connection. It made me think of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when some in Narnia were afraid of Aslan, especially probably the ones that were on the side of the White Witch. Um, Edmund in the beginning was afraid of Aslan, but those that were on uh, Aslan's side were not afraid of him. They saw him more as their their friend, somebody that they could trust, somebody that they knew would come to their rescue. Okay, so I thought that, that kind of reminded me of Jan and Bistro, you know, where Jan is looking at Bistro as more of a, a friend and less like something to be scared of, but Captain Greenwood is looking at Bistro as something to be afraid of. Um, it also gave me a text to self connection because there are times when I have been afraid of people's dogs. Um, my neighbors, when I were, was growing up, had a very beautiful dog that was an Irish setter. And I've always really liked dogs, but this was one of the first dogs that I was really afraid of because every time it got around me, it was very exuberant and wanted to jump on me and, and, wanted to kind of nip at me. I understand now, after having, you know, being around Gigantor and everything, that that dog was playing with me. But at the time, it frightened me a whole lot. So the fact that that dog would kind of want to nip at me kind of reminded me of how Bistro bit Jan's finger. The difference is, is that Jan understood that Bistro was trying to make friends, and I didn't understand that that Irish setter dog was trying to be my friend. I thought he was trying to eat me. All right, a uh, summary for Chapter 14. The kids are at the transit camp in Berlin when they, where they learn of a chip, chimp, not a chip, a chimp named Bistro that has escaped from the zoo uh, and is on the loose. And when Jan hears this, he disappears. The kids don't make the connection at, in chapter 14 that Jan has disappeared because of Bistro. Okay, I hope that you did make that connection. In chapter 15, Jan reappears. I said he reappeared to save Captain Greenwood. That's not actually true. He reappeared to save Bistro. And he just happened to save Captain uh, Greenwood from Bistro at the same time. Um, Captain Greenwood was afraid of losing his Jeep because he was responsible for it. But So Jan did save Bistro. He did save Captain Greenwood. He did save the Jeep. And Jan recaptured Bistro uh, by being kind to him. You know, he, he led him back to safety. That's what I mean by recapturing him. Okay, so now I'm going to read chapter 16 and 17. Chapter 16 is called Through the Russian Zone. Take the Potsdam Road and follow your noses, the family were told, and off they went, singing a gay song with their heads in the air. If they had gone due west towards Belgium, they might have traveled more quickly, for this was the general direction of the traffic. Fewer refugees were moving south, so lifts were scarce, and they were on their feet most of the time. They crossed the Elbe, that's a river, they crossed the Elbe near Roslau by a bridge that had not been too badly damaged for the Russians to repair. Here they were held up for a day by a spearhead of the Russian army bound, so rumor had it, for Prague to drive the Germans out of Czechoslovakia. 
Okay, so right here we get a clue that the war is not over, but the Germans have been driven out of Berlin. Okay, and we know they've been driven out of Warsaw. Never before had Ruth seen so many soldiers. First came the tanks to clear the way, next column after column of marching soldiers tired and dirty in the ragged uniforms. They came from the Ukraine and the Tartar Republics, from the Ural Mountains and the Caucasus, hey, we just learned about those, from the countries of the Baltic, from Siberia, Mongolia, over the bridge they poured in their thousands while everyone else stood by to let them pass. I know that long, excuse me, I know that song, cried Branya as she caught a snatch of a Cossack song from a group of soldiers. Father taught it to us. Do you remember? Yes, I remember, said Ruth. It was the summer we spent by the Djanik River. We were on a raft floating downstream between the wooded peaks. She sighed and the tune was lost in another burst of laughter. Standing there, they heard many songs, some of them bright and jolly, some of them slow and poignantly sad. The family squeezed over the bridge behind the last of the marching columns. They were hardly across when screaming horns announced the arrival of the staff cars, mostly Mercedes and horses which had been taken from the Nazis. Next, cars with secretaries, cars with war booty, Fur coats, textiles, carpets, looted china, lorries with furniture, radios, refrigerators, food lorries with tons and tons of Russian delicacies like caviar and sturgeon and vodka and Crimean wine, lorries bearing proud posters, we welcome the liberating army. More marching columns. Columns of women and girls in gray-green uniform with tight blouses and high boots, they had come to do the cooking and the washing to help in the hospitals and look after the sick. Tagged on to them were clusters of small boys picking from the woods and burned out villages. They had come because they were hungry and the Red Army was ready to feed them. The whole world's gone by today. Surely there can't be any more people left, said Branya, as the dust began to subside. But there was still a rear guard to come, and soon the dust was flying again under the wheels of hundreds of small light carts drawn by low Cossack horses. Now for a lift, cried Jan, as a gray old man, whip in hand, came rattling by in a cart with a canvas roof. And before Ruth could stop him, he had hauled himself up over the tailboard. We'll never catch up with him. The carts are all full, cried Ruth. But as soon as an open cart with nothing in the back but a heap of straw, some fodder, and a leg of smoke pork picked up the three of them. It was an anxious ride, for the cart was traveling more slowly than Jan's, and with the dust and the overtaking and the spreading out into the fields on either side of the road, they quickly lost sight of Jan. Jan was perfectly happy. He had landed on a pile of straw as comfortable as a feather bed beside a sick soldier and a pen with a squawking goose. And if it was not worth his while to make the acquaintance of the soldier, he thought quite differently about the goose. All afternoon, Ruth and Edit kept a lookout for Jan's cart. As it happened, their vigilance proved unnecessary, for the whole caravan halted at dusk to camp for the night. Fires were kindled, stock replenished from nearby farms, and there was eating and drinking and singing. Jan was quickly found and forgiven. Next day, their ways parted, and the family cut across country in the direction of Bitterfield and Halle. Before they left Berlin, the British soldier had provided them with ration cards, and with the money he had given them, they were able to buy food. For recapturing the chimp, Jan had been rewarded with a hundred marks. Marks is money, like dollars. He trusted this to Ruth and did not question how she chose to spend it. When at last the money ran out, they were dependent on what they could beg or work for. Work was difficult to find for the factories were idle and farms had absorbed the first prisoners of war to be released. Some villages refused to admit them, having neither food nor shelter for any more refugees. But for the most part they met with kindness and were not refused food if it could be spared. 
Most big towns had their UNRWA food kitchens, and these were always welcome. But best of all were the transit camps. It was the time when camp commandants used to send soldiers round with guns to seize stores. They ransacked warehouses, factories, shops, even garrets and barns, for the peasants had hidden plenty of way in the plenty away, and the slave workers that swelled the camps often knew the hiding places. One such camp had a Polish section where a school had been started. Had the family stayed here, and they were pressed to do so, they would have received all the food and schooling and medical attention that they needed. Edik was very tired when they arrived, and Ruth was ready to stay as long as he needed rest, but he recovered after a few days and was eager to be off. Whenever he was tempted to linger, one peep of that silver sword was enough to spur him on again. All day long the sun smiled down upon them, upon toilers in the fields where fresh crops were springing up, upon towns littered with the debris of war, upon a people numbed by defeat, living from day to day with no thought for the future, upon women standing in bread queues or wheeling barrows of wood that they had collected in the forest for their kitchen fires, upon wounded soldiers sitting on hospital balconies basking in the sun's heat. Some of the soldiers waved to the family as they passed by, and the family waved back. So they came to the edge of the Russian zone. In the early days of peace, there were many places where it was not difficult to slip unobserved from one zone to the next. They crossed the frontier somewhere in the Thuringian forest without realizing that they had done so, and it was only the unfamiliar uniforms of the soldiers and the strange language of the notices that told them that they had now reached the American zone. Chapter 17 The Signal It was the middle of June. In spite of the long spell of unbroken weather, Edic was no better. At night, as they lay under the bright stars, his cough would keep Ruth awake, and she could not throw off her anxiety. Each day his walking became slower and more painful. This was partly because his feet were sore, for his shoes had worn out, and the substitute pair he had plaited from reeds was not had not lasted long. Ruth decided he must rest for a week. They found a peasant Pardon me. They found a pleasant site in a meadow by a mill stream. They planned to camp here till she and Jan had earned enough money to buy Edic a new pair of shoes. Ruth, Ruth took a cleaning job at the local school while Jan went haymaking and Edic rested under the trees with Branya to look after him. All day he lay in the shade for the sun was scorching hot. At night a chill wind blew, but he was warm, for they had lit a fire for him, and he lay beside it looking up at the stars that peeped between the willow branches, till he was lulled to sleep by the gentle music of the stream. So he rested well, and ate well too, for there were no shortages of food. Several times Jan came home from work with a bag full of such food as they had never tasted before— chicken, lobster, salted pork, and luncheon meat. When Ruth asked where it had come from, he said, from the farmer. He's a generous man. But her suspicions were not quieted, for it was all in tins and labeled in a strange language. I know he's stealing it, she told Edick. It's American food, and I think he must get it from the depot, yet I don't know. The depot is closely guarded, and I've never seen him anywhere near. If he's thieving, he'll get caught. The Americans don't miss much. There's a hall next to the school and a military court trying cases all day long. He brought nothing back yesterday or the day before, said Edick. Perhaps the source has dried up. He says the farmer has promised him more tomorrow, said Ruth. Edick was determined to clear up the mystery. Without saying a word to Ruth, the next afternoon he went alone to the farm where Jan worked and hid behind a hedge. He saw Jan leave the haymaking before the day's work was over. Instead of returning to camp, he hurried off in the opposite direction straight through the town. Edic followed him to a level crossing outside the town. Suddenly a ragged youth sprang out of a bush by the roadside and beckoned to Jan. 
The meeting seemed to have been arranged, for Jan showed no surprise and slipped down from the road to join the youth. Edik crept as close as he could without making his presence known and waited. He waited so long that he began to wonder if they had given him the slip. Then suddenly Jan broke out of the cover and ran half doubled up along one side of the railway line in the direction of the signal ramp. The youth had disappeared. Edik climbed into a tree which gave a good view of the line. From here he saw Jan swarm up the side of the signal ramp. It extended right across the track and lie down flat and motionless on top, above the line. What was he up to now? As far as Edik knew, train wrecking was not one of Jan's pastimes, for in spite of his twisted sense of values, he was not deliberately destructive. I must go and find out thought Edik, and jumping down from the tree, he walked along beside the track till he came to the foot of the ramp. What's the game, Jan? he called. Jan was startled, for he was still lying flat and hardly visible, and had not noticed him. He swore at Edik and told him to go away. With a clank and a rattle of loose metal that took them both by surprise, the signal on the up line changed to green. Go away, you fool, go away, Jan screamed at him and flinging himself at the signal, he began to tug at it. Edik was really agitated now, for he could hear the distant rumble of an approaching train. He shouted to Jan to come down, but the boy was working furiously with a wrench and what looked like a pair of wire cutters and paid no heed. The noise of the train grew louder. Puffs of dirty smoke rose above the trees. With the thought of some dreadful accident impending, Edik sprang up the side of the ramp and started to climb. It was not an exercise for which he was well fitted. He had already spent most of his small reserve of strength, and his muscles were too flabby to give him much grip. The ramp, too, had been badly damaged and hastily and inexpertly repaired. An iron stanchion broke away under his foot. Grass, gasping and coughing, with a great effort, he hung on with his hands and somehow hauled himself up. When his head appeared over the top, he saw that the signal had changed to red. Jan was slithering backward like an eel in a frantic hurry. His feet scraped past Edik's face, nearly knocking him off. As he passed him, his eyes were blazing, his face purple with fury. But because of the din of the train, Edik could not hear what he said. With no thought in his head but to prevent an accident, Edik groped his way along the top of the ramp. As the train, it was a goods train, approached, laboriously chugging with an endless winding line of trucks, he tottered upright and waved. He need not have done so, for the signal was at red, where Jan had put it and the engine had already started to jam the brakes on. With a great clanking from the truck, pardon me, with a great clanking from <coughs> truck to truck, as the bumpers collided, the train, <coughs> pardon me, my dog is barking, the train screeched to a standstill, a hiss of t steam, a long, shrill, whistling, a dark cloud, and a great swallowing of filthy smoke. When he had finished coughing and wiped the smoke from his eyes, he caught sight of someone shouting at him from below. It was not Jan. He had vanished. An American military policeman was pointing a revolver at him. Okay, and that's what this picture is of. So, Edik has been captured by an American soldier. All right, tomorrow I will share chapter 18 with you.